Hello, and welcome to the Evelyn Y. Davis Studios of the National Press Foundation. My name is Rachel Jones, and I'm the Director of Journalism Initiatives for NBF. Before we get started, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsor, the Evelyn Y. Davis Foundation, for the support of the Widening Pipeline Fellowship Program. For this fifth session, we are going to be focusing on the issue of preserving our democracy and what is the journalist's role in that effort. The term democracy suggests a society that where all or most voices are heard and where uh, participation in the public realm is possible. But when women and people of color are aggressively blocked from that participation, the goal line moves farther and farther away. The Center for Democracy and Technology's soon to be released research finds that misinformation, disinformation, and online gender-based violence are all increasing for women of color political candidates. And they'll share the data and some insights about coverage on this topic. Joined today by Dhanaraj Thakur, the research director at the Center for Democracy and Technology, and Devin Hankerson Madrigal, who is the research manager for CDT. But before we get started on our conversation, we're also going to hear from the Director of Communications for CDT, Ari Ben Goldberg, and he's going to share some information about the report. Ari. Hi, thanks, Rachel. Um, no, I'm just going to be here for 30 seconds just to do a little bit of uh, housekeeping. Um, as you said, I'm the Communications Director here at CDT, the Center for Communication, the Center for Democracy and Technology. And um, I just want everybody to, I just wanted to let everyone know that that the report that my colleagues Devin and Donaraj are, are about to discuss is slated to be publicly released next Thursday, October 27th. So it is embargoed until that time. So everything today is officially off the record. And when Thursday comes around next week, uh, we'll be more than happy to get you guys a copy of the report. It will be on our website at cdt.org. Um, and I and my colleagues will also be very happy to arrange interviews with Devin and Donna Raj at that time. So I appreciate your patience and I hope what you, what, what they, um, have to say you find interesting, but, um, you know, please, uh, be aware that, uh, this whole information, this whole convo is off the record and, uh, everything is embargoed until next Thursday, the 27th. That being said, let's, uh, let's send it over to you guys. Thanks for that, Ari. And uh, I think this prompt will help us prepare and uh, be ready to produce some good content at that time. So Donaraj, please uh, get us started on this conversation. Sure, thank you, Rachel. Um, thanks, Ari, for the intro. And thanks to you all for spending some time to listen to some of the uh, research insights that we have uh, developed here. So a bit of background is that CT, uh, spends a lot of our time focusing on policy advocacy to protect people's rights online in many, across many different areas. Uh, the issue of mis- and disinformation and online abuse touches a lot of those areas and so it's something that we're very much concerned with. Um, uh, when you look, think about a lot of the debates, the policy discussions around mis- and disinformation, it's often about like uh, foreign entities and what they're doing in the US one of the gaps that we thought of early on and uh, after consulting many groups is that there's little, little discussion around uh, impacts domestically and more specifically from an uh, intersectional angle. By that, I mean looking at issues of Jace, uh, as like gender, race, and maybe other demographic uh, categories as well. So because of that gap, we decided to <clears throat> embark on this research and really look at this problem uh, of mis- and disinformation and abuse started at, at political candidates. Um, the, the other motivation here is, as Rachel mentioned at the start, which is this issue about lack of representation, particularly uh, in, in Congress for many communities of color. And we wanted to understand the extent to which this is also an additional barrier um, to entry for many different candidates of color. So uh, what we did, the first part of it, was to take data from Twitter as to, ana to, ana to analyze discussions on Twitter during the election period of 
2020. So that's like October to December 2020. And then we took a representative sample of all the candidates that ran. There were 1,100 candidates that ran for Congress in 2020. Uh, we took a sample of all of them and looked at the Twitter conversations around them. So tweets targeted at them, tweets talking, mentioning them, or responding to them, that kind of thing. Um, and based on that, we're looking for a couple of things, the, the, the you know, evidence of mis- and disinformation, uh, different types of abuse, and so on. So what I want to do now is just to go through some of these top level findings with you to share what some of the, the things that we learned and that are um, reflective of all, the, the, you know, all candidates that run during our time. And then um, Devin is going to come in and talk more about the implications of that and uh, particularly in terms of what we, how we what all we our views on solving this issue, as well as implications for even you all, all as journalists. So one thing we found from the get-go is that uh, women of color candidates are twice as likely as other kinds of candidates to be targeted with mis- and disinformation. And when I say other candidates, I mean white men, white women, and men of color. So women of color are twice as likely to be subject with this kind of false information and a lot of that revolved around elections and like uh, election processes. So false claiming, promoting false narratives around mail-in ballots. But a lot of it was, this was 2020, early, or, you know, first year of the pandemic. So a lot of it was around COVID-19 as well uh, and, and, and promoting false information, pushing false information at candidates about COVID-19, like uh, uh, precautions and so on. Abuse is another major issue that we looked at. And we looked at many different kinds of abuse from like uh, doxing to use of offensive language. But what we found was that women of color were more likely to re receive sexist and racist abuse than any other group. Um, and including all the three other groups that I mentioned as well. Um, uh, women, of, women of color, um, what I should say in addition to that is that women of color were also four times as likely, particularly compared to white candidates, uh, and twice as likely as men of color to be targeted with violent abuse. So these are like threats of violence, uh, threats to commit violence, or threats to encourage others to commit violence uh, targeted at these candidates. Some other kinds of candidates, for example, uh, white men were often subject to more offensive language than, than women of color. But I wanted to distinguish the, the severity of the kinds of abuse that women of color candidates in particular were uh, more likely to um, be faced with. A lot of activists, researchers, and others often point to the combination of these things, mis- and disinformation and online harassment, uh, being combined in a way to essentially undermine the political eff effectiveness of uh, women candidates. And so we also explore this issue. What if, to what extent were there tweets or, you know, posts that combined both misinformation and, misinform misinform and abuse? And what here again, what we found is that women of color compared to all other kinds of candidates were more likely to be targeted with posts that combined misinformation and, and abuse. So it would in also may involve things like false, false claims around election processes, but it would be combined with like, uh, threats of violence or other kinds of abusive um, material. Um, two more quick things then on, on the, the analysis of this with the data. When it, came, when it came to stepping back from abuse and misinformation, we also examined the extent to, the, to which tweets targeted at these candidates uh, pinpointed their identity, whether in terms of gender, race, and so on. And here, women of color candidates, more than any other kind of candidates, in fact, five, they're five times more likely than other candidates to be targeted with tweets that focus on their gender and race. So these are tweets that called out the fact that they were women and called out the fact that they were African-American women or Latino women and, and so on. And this is not a phenomenon you see with other kinds of candidates, particularly like white men and, and others, right? Their identity, for in the case of white men, white women and others, was not as at the forefront the way it was when it came to how people responded to women of color of candidates online. And then finally, women of color candidates were subject to tweets. They were less likely to receive tweets that have a positive or supportive um, um, position compared to other candidates, in particular white women. In fact, white women were 
of all the different groups were more likely to receive positive tweets or supportive tweets than other, other kinds of candidates. We, we also combined this in the second part of the story to actually where we, with interviews, interviews with members and candidates, women of color specifically that ran in 2020, to understand the kinds of impacts that uh, these trends that we identified, these patterns where they were, where they were more likely to be targeted with these kinds of abusive and uh, tweets or false information, what kind of impact that had on them specifically. The feedback that we got, the, the insight we got from these interviews, from these discussions with the candidates themselves was that, you know, in their view, the aim here was really to um, undermine their candidacy and their participation in politics. This was directly then a means to create additional barriers for them to either enter um, political representation or, or stay within um, politics itself. Um, a lot of this was not just about challenging their, you know, their electoral prospects, but also about damaging their reputations. And one consistent theme that we found was that the people that were launching these attacks that were promoting false information and abuse, from the candidate perspectives, it was about trying to control the public, um, public perception of these candidates. It was, a, it was a way of controlling uh, how they were viewed by the public in general, um, you know, the extent to which they were qualified for these positions, uh, and so on. But often the attacks were not about their policy positions. It wasn't about their ideas for solving public policy problems or other kinds of problems. It was simply because they were women. And in, in the case of the groups of work, not just women, but women who uh, had a particular racial identity, gender identity, it went further than that. In fact, if it's also dependent. It also came down to parental status. So in some cases, these women were mothers, and they were attacked for the fact that not just they were women of color, but that they were mothers as well. There was an age angle as well, depending on whether they were perception of being too too young or too old, and there was even issues around immigrant status. So there are many different dimensions in which they were um, reported being attacked because uh, in terms of abuse and and mis and disinformation. Um, the, the last thing I'll say is that regardless of all these attacks, many of the clients that we spoke to spoke about um, the impacts on their teams, but how together with their campaigns teams, they were able to come up with different strategies to address these problems. And in some cases, many, uh, the candidates we spoke, spoke to are still involved in politics and not have not uh, succumbed to the, 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 the tactics that are the objectives of these um, people that post abusive messages or false information about them online. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there. I'll stop there, actually, because I just want to give a quick summary of what we found. But I'm going to hand it over to Devon to talk more about the implications of these. Devon, please. Sure. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the recommendations and solutions that we uh, proffer in the report, as well as some of the implications uh, to kind of give you a sense for where we see um, next steps going in terms of the stakeholders who are relevant in this space. So as Donna Raj said, the study de demonstrates that women of color face significant and substantial mis and disinformation and online abuse, and obviously often at higher levels than other types of candidates. So there are a number of stakeholders in this space that we make recommend directional recommendations for to include social media companies, uh, campaigns themselves, and researchers that we think would help to tackle some of the threats that women of color candidates um, see and that they encounter, um, in particular, mis- and disinformation and online abuse. So I'm not going to mention all of them. I've sort of selected some that I'll talk about today. And obviously, in the full report, um, there are a much a, a bigger number of them mentioned. So I'll start with social media companies. Obviously, we, I don't think, I think Don Raj mentioned, we did look at Twitter for the content analysis. Um, and so you can sort of take, but you can take some of these recommendations sort of more broader than just Twitter, because in our interviews, for example, we heard from candidates that they were facing some of these attacks on multiple platforms. So it is not just Twitter, it includes um, the host of social media companies that um, campaigns use to promote their um, candidacy during the election. Um, so social media companies specifically could clearly articulate policies that prohibit content that harasses and abuses someone on the basis of race or gender. Um, so that's one area that we think 
social media companies could um, could push forward. This is in their terms of service or in their policies and also obviously in enforcement around those policies. Um, social media companies could also provide publicly available transparency reports around election mis and disinformation and abuse before, during, and after an election. We think that these types of reports could provide a holistic view into content moderation, uh, especially into integrity operations by the service during these periods that are very sensitive around elections. And we're thinking sort of high level numbers would be helpful. So aggregated numbers on flagged posts and actions that the social media companies had specifically taken, for example. And we think that these reports should also include a focus on mis and disinformation and abuse, um, in particular, because we know that political candidates are being targeted by these types of messages. And, and it would be helpful if they were also broken down by demographics. So similar to what we are reporting in our, um, in our publication that looks specifically at women of color, that looks specifically at white men, that looks specifically at women, white women, et cetera. That kind of information would be, I think, helpful to the public, to journalists, people who are sort of trying to understand what's going on on the platforms ahead of elections. Uh, thirdly, uh, social media companies can make data available to independent researchers to sort of give them an opportunity to study the impacts of mis and disinformation online, um, in particular on uh, political candidates. So that is to make sure that researchers like us can have access to information that will help us to analyze and understand some of the patterns uh, on the platforms and at the current moment, um, there are some tools available, but there could be more made available. Social media companies could also take additional steps to protect and prevent mis and disinformation from reaching women of color candidates. So a lot of what we heard from, um, or some of what we heard from interviewees was that as they um, purchased online ads, to support their campaigns that expose them to even more mis and disinformation because of the exposure um, that sort of engaging in that kind of ad buying produce, which is makes sense. But I think there's like a special is an issue here that we think needs um, specific attention. Another stakeholder group that we identify specific recommendations for our campaign. So these are political organizations or other initiatives. So candidate training organizations, for example, that support candidates. We heard from a number of um, interviewees that even though they um, ha there are existing trainings for candidates using social media tools, that there could be more done in this area. So for example, campaigns could offer free or low cost campaign training that's designed to prepare women of color candidates for the social media landscape to give them a better sense of what they're likely to encounter. Um, these kinds of organizations, candidate training organizations should think about ways to test the efficacy of resiliency training for up and coming women of color politicians. Um, and just based on some of what we report in the publication is that in journalistic circles, there are existing resiliency trainings um, that have been shown to be effective. And this might be a model for candidate training organizations as they think about ways to support and prepare women of color candidates candidates to run successful campaigns and to stay in the race. So we see this as a way also for candidate training organizations and political organizations to support candidates in terms of their physical, mental, and mental and emotional health. Um, and I think that what we what we took away from these interviews is that candidates really didn't, they had underestimated the reality of what it meant to campaign as a woman of color um, on social media. And so there was, there was a gap between what they expected and what they found. Um, uh, campaigns and uh, political organizations could also um, produce uh, additional toolkits. We know that there are some toolkits that they produce to help candidates navigate social media, but they could do more in this area to help inform candidates of digital security best practices. Um, just the existing toolkits that are out there don't really seem to be attuned to the needs of women of color candidates in this way, given what we're finding about the kind of targeted harassment that they face as they run campaigns. And so I think there needs to be, there's a calibration 
um, question here that we're raising for some of these organizations that are producing these resources. Um, and these obviously should be focused on setting realistic expectations. Again, there's this gap between what candidates expect and then what they actually encounter. Because what they, what we notice and what we find is that the volume and variety of content that ca candidates are facing is sort of very different and, and out of step with what they expected to find. So as for some of the implications, how does this issue um, impact local level candidates. So we specifically looked at federal level candidates, candidates running for the House, candidates running for the Senate. But I think that based on our understanding, having spoken to many candidate training organizations, there are many more women of color who are running at the state and local level. And I don't, and I think in terms of the nature of the concerns that we're raising, there really isn't a significant difference for women who are running at the women at the local and state level. We know that women who are running at state and local levels encounter similar types of race and gender uh, online based targeting including threats of violence. So we think that there is a lot of transferability between what we raise here in the context of federal candidates and for state and local candidates. And as I mentioned um, earlier, some of the research suggests that journalists, particularly women journalists of color are also subject to the same kind of harassment. As public figures, we know that there are a lot of there's a lot of overlap in what we're describing here that applies to women in different um, domains of public life. And this may obviously be very um, pertinent for journalists uh, specifically. Um, and I think some of what we, just in our sort of discussion and understanding of this issue, we suspect that the problem may in fact be even worse for women of color journalists. Um, and that one of the things that we see sort of being an outcome, both of the kind of targeted harassment we talk about in the context of political candidates, as, as well as for journalists, is that there are likely to be chilling effects. How does it affect what you report on if you're a journalist? How does it, ref ref how does it impact what kinds of stories you decide to cover? And then similarly on the political side, how does it impact, uh, or how does it, um, how does, a woman of color make the decision as to whether or not to run? Does she hear that it's sort of not a safe place and therefore decides to drop out of a race? Does she decide not to run at all? And these are directly related to the kind of representative democracy that we're able to have in this country when people are making the decision because of the kind of online harassment and abuse and intimidation they face online, whether or not to engage um, it as part of our governance system or whether or not they just... Uh, hi, Devin, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but exactly on this point, would you mind giving over one or two of those anecdotes um, of, of the candidates that's, that spoke to you in confidence about that? Sure, so um, to the point of, uh, and it's totally fine that interrupt Ari. Um, so to Ari's, uh, thank you for mentioning. So one of the, one of the implications, obviously, other than chilling effects, which is people decide not to run, is that people may be in a race and they decide to drop out of the race because of some of the, the nature of some of the threats that they face. And in confidence, one of the candidates that we spoke to in a pre-interview, excuse me, mentioned to me that she received a threat to her children that included a picture of her children, the, the, her, the school, her children's school. Um, and that from her point of view as a mother, she could decide to continue in the race and sort of overlook this threat as perhaps being someone who potentially took a picture from Google Maps or who you know was maybe not making a credible threat, but she didn't feel like she could take that risk. So as a result, she dropped out of the race because she said, as she said in her words, if something were to happen to one of my children and I stayed in this race, I could never forgive myself. Even if it isn't, even if it wasn't serious, I can't take the chance that this person isn't um, making a serious credible threat and I couldn't live with myself as a mother if I stayed in this race and something were to happen. So I think that, you know, kind of chills you to the bone to really kind of see the kind of calculus that that women are making when they receive these threats online, which could very easily and often can turn into um, offline instances of offline violence. Um, 
So, and I'll stop there because I know that we want to leave time for a question and answer. So as the journalists um, prepare their questions or, or get ready to, I'm gonna jump in really quickly because I'm intrigued by this issue of, or the a reference to resiliency training. Could you talk a little bit more about what that would look like or what that's comprised of? I'm, I'm intrigued by that. So I think we, resiliency training can look like any, any I, I'm not an expert on resiliency training, but what we do know is that in the journalistic space, there are a number of programs that offer resiliency training for journalists and that it has been shown to be effective in terms of giving journalists um, support while they are encountering high levels of targeted harassment, perhaps doxing, perhaps stalking, perhaps you know, sharing of, you know, false images or video that, you know, paints them in a negative light. And that can help them to stay in the field and to continue to do their work. I don't necessarily have a, a, a rubric for how those are structured, but I know that um, there's a lot of good resources out there that um, uh, can be adapted, obviously, for political candidates um, to sort of, and, and also with this idea of efficacy in mind. Let's make sure that the resources we're providing actually work to do the, to, to affect the change that we're hoping for. Yeah, I think I must have misheard it because I, I assumed you were talking about specifically about resiliency training for political candidates. I wondered how that would look. And, and that would be a really interesting sort of uh, field to, to get in. I think we we think that it can be helpful in in terms of helping political candidates, but there at least what we found is that nothing exists quite yet, but that what we've seen in the journalistic space can maybe be a model for what can be produced in the political space. Do any of the uh, fellows have questions? Please feel free to jump in here. I have a question. Did you go ahead? Sorry. No, excuse me. Um, I was going to say, I have a question. My name is Gabrielle Suttles. I'm a, <laughs> my name is Gabrielle Suttles and I'm a reporter for PolitiFact. So uh, in fact checking, we definitely encounter this. Um, how can I access this training? And I'd also like to share it with my coworkers as well. For the, for the training models that exist for journalists, we have some references in our report and I'm happy to share that with, with you all um, about organizations and other uh, uh, I guess toolkits that have been de developed for residents to train for among journalists. Um, uh, but as Devon mentioned, this is we, we, we're pointing people to that as a maybe a model that could be developed for like political can specifically. But yeah, we can definitely share the references. Um, I'm not sure if we can do it on this call because we'd have to look it up. But maybe afterwards we can share through through Rachel. Thank Amanda. you. Hi, my name is Amanda Goki. I'm a reporter with the New Hampshire Bulletin. I was just curious. I mean, we talked a lot among this group about systemic racism, um, and this is maybe just an obvious question, but I'm curious if your report looked at what was sort of behind these attacks targeting um, women of color, um, if there was any sort of sense that you got from the research that you did about um, what was driving this and sort of the why behind um, what you were finding. We spoke to candidates specifically and asked them what they thought was behind some of these attacks. We can't speak directly to the, the perpetrators themselves and what their aims were, but we can tell you what candidates perceive the goals to be. And in their view, they sort of describe what they thought was an attempt to get them to internalize uh, the sense of oppression or internalize the sense that they were unworthy of holding power to get them to really um, buy into some of the narratives that were circulating around their campaign. Um, and that was their sense. And they also said that they also got the sense that it was an effort to silence them, to get them to leave politics. And that's their perception of what they what they perceive to be the the goal of the harassment. But in this report, we didn't actually um, we didn't actually like uh, talk to 
perpetrators, for example, to kind of get at their intent in a more direct way. Um, but I think if if you're someone who is subject to enough of these this kind of harassment, you kind of get a sense for what you might think that the goal is. So I would I would sort of I'd sort of take their word about what they sort of perceive the intentions to be as 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 at least worth considering. Before we go to Mbenti, um, Devin, let's continue the, the thread we were on the other day in our prep call. And for me, as an African-American woman, I, I sort of extrapolated out that perhaps um, they are targeted because of their superpower <laughs> or simply because uh, they might be perceived as being the biggest threat or if they are empowered too much, they can get too many other people to listen to them. And I know it's hard as a researcher to be able to quantify that, but can you share your thoughts, the, sh the thoughts you shared with me about that issue? I'm trying to remember what I said, actually. Um, well, again, I mean, I think anecdotally, I, I, if I recall, uh, anecdotally, uh, some of the, the women of color did sort of feel that that could be underneath it or around it. And I think you've mentioned, I'm putting you on the spot here. You may have said something from your personal perspective, which is not- I may have said something from my personal perspective. Which um, is not relevant, but come on, I mean, sister, to, we, you're among friends here. <laughs> um, so, so I think that, um, so the question is why is is it that women of color in particular have some kind of superpower and that that is the reason that they are being targeted in this way i think that probably uh, a more um thorough uh, analysis would kind of just show and i think we pointed this in the report that disinformation and these online threats it really is building on some pre-existing uh, discrimination that exists in our society um writ large and so if you think about the fact of us taking an intersectional approach you can kind of see that it's the racism layered on with the misogyny perhaps layered on with you could call it um uh, I don't know, in the case of, well, misogyny would also sort of mean that women would get attacked on the basis of them being a mother or on the basis of them being whatever age they are. Um, and, and we saw that in the report. So for example, some of the candidates said that they were being attacked because they were perceived as too young and inexperienced, but then some were being attacked because they were too old and out of touch. Like you can't win for losing. So you sort of see that there are all these intersecting lines of attack and narratives that get overlaid onto these candidates. And so if you look at it from that perspective, I think you can kind of see how um, the, the frequency and volume, right? The diversity and, um, uh, and sort of um, variety of the attacks tends to, it grows because people have more fodder, more opportunity, more lines of attack, more narratives to draw upon to then, you know, try to remove you from the political process. And I think that obviously from a historical perspective, we know that women of color have not been as in not ha who have not been in positions of power, particularly in governance at the federal level in the past. And so I think to your point, it is a threat. It's like, there hasn't been somebody who has this identity that occupies these positions of power, and therefore there's a stronger reaction to them entering into those spaces and also to them voicing the concerns that, you know, only they can voice because those are the very concerns that have been um, marginalized outside of those spaces for so long that it's, I, I mean, this is again, me editorializing, but I think it's, it kind of creates a de destabilizing uh, effect because nobody in those chambers has heard from these groups of people. Uh, and now they're hearing from them almost as if for the first time, but previous to now, it's as it, these were conversations, these were voices that weren't allowed in these spaces. So they're not used to hearing from them. That's, that's just, that's just, that's my. Yeah. And, and I, I think Rachel, okay. yeah. And then Rachel, if I, if I recall during that conversation, we talked about how there are studies, you know, done here in the U S and globally about, about women uh, being particularly uh, attacked uh, online. Um, 
And, but, but this is like the first study that we're aware of globally that's ever been done that's intersectional, that not just looks at, at women, but women specifically of color. Um, Donna Raj, you're our research director. Is that, is that, is that an exaggeration or is that fair to say? No, that? that's, so it's correct. Especially at the, the scale that we did, the way we looked at a uh, sample of all the candidates that run. Yeah. I, just, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Were you going to? I was just going to add to what Devin was saying, that the, the, the reality is that there are more women of color candidates running now at all levels. And it, it, it goes to this um, perceived per perception of threat because the, on, what underlies systemic racism is really a power issue, right? As um, I think someone had raised earlier. And so there's this perception that people are going to lose power. And so there's this pushing back and it pushed back at the first, the group that they think is leading that threat that comes back to women of color. I would just like quickly add on to that. Like, I think we also talked about in our call now remembering that there's this aspect of transgressiveness, um, the transgressiveness of women, the transgressiveness of people of color to seek power, to seek authority um, with the underlying assumption being that they're not worthy of either. And so I think that that sort of creates this um, ire perhaps that people exhibit in these attacks. But again, uh, for me, the grassroots issue so, so if you have a woman of color like a uh, Fannie Lou Hamer or, uh, you know, um, I think the, the perception could be that these women have a power and an access and an ability to coalesce at the grassroots that's also perceived as a threat. I, that would be my, my thought. Mabenti, please jump in. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to ask a question that's kind of related to something that was briefly touched on. So we are seeing yourself. Oh, hi, uh, I'm a Bincy and I'm a reporter with USA Today. Um, and so I guess what I'm wondering is that, you know, more women are running for office, right? Like which, with each Congress that we get, we get like more and more record levels of women in Congress. And it's, a, it's especially women of color with each and every Congress that we get. And so what I'm, what I'm wondering is um, one, did you hear any stories or did anyone tell you about like what these women who are actually running and winning, like what they did differently to overcome sort of that violence? Out of my mind. Um, and then two, right, we're seeing, cause I, I just did a story in the summer, but I did do a story about how more women of color are winning in predominantly white house districts as well. So I'm, I'm wondering Every if day. you heard from anyone who talked about what they're doing to successfully win in these races, despite all of the violence that they may be getting online. So I'm just curious. One of the things that we did um, hear from candidates in the interviews was that, uh, and, and this came across when it came to who was better situated to manage the online threats was a resource issue. So if you have funds to be able to hire a campaign team, a social media person that you can delegate social media um, work to, as opposed to being yourself personally, the one who runs your own social media campaigns, that made a difference as to the level of exposure that women themselves were um, exposed to. So there's a difference between campaigns as to who has the ability to hire that kind of team and hire that kind of staff uh, who gets support to do that and who may be uh, running their own Facebook, running their own Twitter, and therefore they see every single hateful message that comes their way. Um, and so I think, you know, obviously in the campaigns that do have staff, what we, what we heard was that then those staffers were the first line of defense versus uh, candidate being the only line of defense. And I think that the candidate seeing all of those messages is probably more inclined to burn out or to be affected um, in terms of, of trauma than the candidate who perhaps hears at the end of the day um, that they don't have anything to worry about. Donna, did you, you know, want to ask me? I would add that um, we also interviewed like staffers, so the campaign teams themselves, and we could tell that there are differences in the level of experience and, and uh, awareness of different tactics to deal with this kind of online abuse and hate and, and misinformation targeted at, the, at their candidate. Um, 
so I think parts of this is also the resource issue that Devin mentioned, but also this kind of experience that the, key, the teams have themselves in dealing with these issues. I think related to that was a, a, a note that several interviews said in the kind of uh, the varied levels of support that they got from their party. Usually there were, there's very little support, to be honest with you. Many of the parties were like, okay, you're on your own. Uh, but I think in some cases, the candidates have had better uh, networks or better communications, um, and, and that may, may have helped. Um, so I, I think, maybe into your maybe asking about replicability or what we can learn for other candidates is a tough one here because you have issues around resources, you have issues around connections with the party and the experience of the, uh, the campaign. But one thing that they did tell us is that it would be great if they could share these kinds of experiences and lessons with other candidates that are other women of color candidates that want to run. Uh, but there's limited opportunities to do that. Um, again, the, the parties themselves don't have or don't seem as concerned about that kind of uh, sharing, it, it seems, based on what it, the candidate said. Amanda has another question for us. Yeah, I just wanted to return to something that Devin had mentioned kind of in passing about um, these threats also materializing. And I don't know if that was part of the scope of what you looked into, but, um, you know, I think oftentimes I've been told this before, like, oh, you got this threat, like, it's no big deal, nothing's going to come of it. But um, I guess it sounded like you might have some data suggesting that's actually not the case. I was just curious if you could talk a little more about that. So what we what we got for the most part were anecdotes from candidates, like the one that I shared earlier, but we didn't specifically look at, for example, rates of online threats that turn into offline uh, attacks, for example. But um, I know that there's probably data out there that does do that work. Um, I know that there is a, a, a PBS NewsHour report that um, sort of went into detail about a specific state legislator. Um, oh, Gary is mentioning the Southern Poverty Law Center may have that kind of data. Um, but anecdotally, there was a, a PBS news story that went into a Vermont state legislator, uh, her particular story of having online harassment turn into uh, people slashing her tires and um, showing up at her front door. And she... Um, her name is Kaya Morris, actually. She's mentioned um, in our report, which you will see in, in, in a week or two, um, or actually next week. Um, but my, my point is that there are um, examples. Um, I don't know if there's been a study yet that looks more specifically at the degree of, um, like how much offline, online violence then turns into offline violence. John Raj, is that right? Yeah, I could add, <clears throat> so, we did, you're right. We didn't actually try to measure this, the, the impacts from the online uh, post to offline violence. But there were stories, as some of the interviewees told us. One, for example, was uh, they uh, realized that there was some kind of organizi organizing campaign going around to show up at one of their rallies with people, like with um, weapons and so on. And it did happen. And they were really uh, freaked out and worried. There was no, in the end, it was no actual. Fortunately, no actual violence or harm that occurred. Uh, well, I should, it's no actual violence, but the harm was in the sense of this threat of violence that people just standing at the edge of the, you know, the rally with, with weapons. Um, I think uh, when we talk about like, like physical, like real life impacts, the, a lot of the interviews use the word trauma to describe what was happening and their, how it affected them. Um, so, you know, there is this, uh, there is the potential for violence and threats of violence and people actually showing up with weapons, but there's also this, uh, the, 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 you know, the psychological impact of all this, which was very real for many of them. Are there any other questions? If not, I'd like to use the last few minutes of this session to hear from you what kind of stories and, and columns and- Actually, uh, Rachel, I'm sorry. I did have a quick question um, or uh, two questions, forgive me. So what kind of candidate was subject to the most online misinfo and hate? And I mean that in terms of 
uh, party? Was it more so Democrat or GOP? And in terms of the people who expressed that rhetoric or acted out on that rhetoric, uh, were they a part of extremist groups? Were they more so mainstream? What were the kind of trends that you noticed? So most of the, um, all right, in terms of like the content I was using the Twitter data, uh, when you look at party breakdown, um, Democrat candidates, uh, particularly women of color that run under the Democrat ticket, were more likely to be subject to this kind of abuse than and, and misinformation than their Republican uh, counterparts. Um, so I, I'd say, broadly speaking, there was that difference across uh, across party lines. But I think when we say women of color are more likely to be subject to this generally, it includes both Democrats and Re Republicans. So the party affiliation there is not is as, Im as important. But I know if you take all of them together, it seems like Democrats are more likely to be subject to misinformation. Mm -hmm. When it comes to abuse, the the difference is the party line. The difference in, across parties is less less clear. I think. And part of that, I think, is because a lot of the white men, I mentioned a lot of the uh, white men are also subject to kind of abuse around offensive language. A lot of them also happen to be Republican. And so that kind of, you know, skews the scale, to, so to speak. Um, yeah, in terms of like uh, Republican affiliation. But we did in our, in our report, I, you'll see this point out that even though we talk about women of color broadly, there are uh, you know, uh, groups among that where some groups, particularly uh, African-American women, women of African descent, are actually subject to more like uh, incidents of like violent uh, threats and other forms of abuse than say even other women of color. Yeah. Um, were the people who expressed that kind of rhetoric or either they acted out on that rhetoric. Did you notice a trend that they were a part of extremist groups? So, i.e. like Proud Boys or Oath Keepers, or were they more uh, mainstream? That's a tough one. Um, so what we didn't actually, I think we mentioned this earlier, we didn't actually look at who was posting what. Um, we talked to the candidates and they got, we could get a sense from them who, what, what the motivations were, um, but it's hard to tell. That's a different kind of study to be honest some people have tried to look at that and it and point to like groups that you're suggesting like these extremist groups and these kind of coordinated campaigns um but i feel like that might be something we should follow up on as a as another maybe potential research project one more quick one from amanda and then i want to gather us around an idea go ahead yeah, I was just wondering, you sort of touched on this already in talking about white men facing more sort of violent messaging and women of color were facing, um, I think you said, both dis myths and disinformation and then abuse. But were there other differences that you noticed in terms of the types of attacks that were um, launched at different kinds of candidates? I should clarify, when I say white men face, I meant offensive language. And that what, what I mean by that is people calling people an a-hole or something like that. Whereas for women of color, it would literally, you know, we want to kill you, we want to do something bad to you, that kind of it's way was way more severe in terms of the differences between like white men and women of color. So I hope that makes sense. Um but in terms of like different groups, yeah, so there's that difference. Uh, but I mentioned already that women of color were more likely to get abuse that was um, sexist or misogynist in nature, nature compared to every, all the other groups, uh, more racist uh, and or more violent. Um, and the other distinction I mentioned earlier was that white women were more, of all the other groups, were most likely to get this positive, supportive kind of uh, posting compared to the other groups. So... I think we should use these last few minutes uh, that we have you to guide us and advise us on the kinds of stories that we need to be producing. We talked about uh, during the prep call, uh, the possibility of maybe finding a, a person who was going to run and then dropped out because of that, finding a, a student in a college student maybe who's studying politics and, and is exploring possibility of maybe becoming a lobbyist versus actually putting him or herself on the, the front line. So I want to hear from both of you. Give us some some ideas for the kind of stories we could 
now that we have this cushion of time, we can't report on anything until the 27th, so. I think, obviously, since we are going, we are leading, leading up into the midterms, there is a lot of opportunity to talk to um, women and women of color politicians about the kinds of messages and the kinds of attacks they received during uh, the lead up to this race. And particularly at the state and local level, as we know that there are many more women of color who run in those races um, to really sort of show the um, the variation in the instances and the sort of way that these things can escalate from offline to online. I don't think that there is, you'd have far to research or far to find those kinds of um, examples. Um, and I think that just having pointed you all earlier to the NPR uh, article, that article in particular talks about representatives in state and local races from Vermont, from um, Connecticut, from um, different parts of the country. And every story uh, I think is chilling in its own way, but also cr helps to, to sort of shed light on this issue from these various um, races and these various corners of the country. In particular, getting into the nuances of to some of the questions here, who um, I think uh, uh, Ari shared it, Mabenti, but he can maybe share it again. But particularly getting into where the, the attacks they see, where they're coming from. I think we sort of heard anecdotally from candidates as to who, who they felt the attacks were coming from. Um, but I think as you guys are, are delving into particular politicians and talking specifically about their um, races, you get a lot more uh, flavor and color there. And I think that there are so many uh, stories, um, people who dropped out of the race, people who just said, I'm never doing this again, um, that, that would really, I think, add some color and flavor um, just in different regions. Um, to the to the issue that we're trying to um, raise awareness around. Donna Raj, did you want to add anything? Um, you know, I think that's a great suggestion from from Devon. I think um, one of the things that came up in the report is just the different angles. So it wasn't it was race and gender clearly important here, but uh, they attack these a woman candidates based on different kinds of angles, like age, mother, immigration status, and things like that, uh, which many people don't always realize, um, particularly for women of color candidates, it opens up these other areas that uh, these these campaigns target. Um, so it could be interesting to highlight that and, and ex shed more light on those kinds of experiences as well, I think, um, which could, you know, uh, educate readership about the, the, the multidimensionality of, of, of these candidates. Yes, and, and religion as well. Another thought oh. I just had was about <clears throat> a comment that was made earlier about the fact that these women, these candidates are encroaching on a, on a uh, particular area or uh, power or aspect of power. They've never been there before and they're a threat. And so I think journalists need to be able to carefully analyze what's at stake. Why are they a threat to the school board? Why are they a threat to the the whatever council that they're elected to? There's there's a need to sort of put it in a historical context and understand, you know, for a hundred years there have been no women or no people of color on this, and uh, all of a sudden. So that's something to think about. Any, so are there any uh, final comments that you want to add? Any other bits of advice that you want to give to the journalists as we wrap up? Any uh, more and more stories around this issue is like very important, I think, just for people to understand, but also for policymakers. The, the more we policymakers see this and see this in the media, it's like they will appreciate that there are, we, we need many more solutions to address it. Um, um, yeah, and so the more we can see about this issue, I think the better um, we'll be, we'll better off we all be. Just like quickly pitching like a, a quick idea that might be long longer term, but I think it, it pulls on some of the threads of the questions asked here today. Um, that we one of the answers that we gave about the differences in resources between um, can, campaigns and how that affects. Uh, uh, the, the viability 
of a campaign and the kinds of resources that parties are able to contribute to candidates and the differences between the parties there. I think that was something that we did not expect to hear. Um, and it was it was interesting because it it it, it sort of showed us um, maybe who was given more of a chance to stay in a race versus maybe who was going to run out of steam faster. And again, given that the the kind of online attacks and the abuse is sort of um, we know that that exists. I think you can kind of see the implications very clearly if if the landscape is sort of uneven in that regard. And we know what we know about wealth disparities in the country. So, I mean, maybe that's a little bit much, but I think, I mean, we know, we know what we know. I think that there is a real, there's a real um, benefit to supporting women of color candidates, putting money behind their campaigns from the party standpoint. Um, if, you know, we are in parties that want to see inclusive democracy, if we want, if we're saying we want a representative democracy, are we putting our money behind those words? And on that very powerful note, I'd like to thank the Center for Democracy and Technology, uh, Donna Raj Thakur, Devin Hankerson Madrigal, and Ari Ben Goldberg. Uh, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to help us. And a quick reminder, uh, this information will be embargoed until the 27th. So, um, in that time, please, I'm sure speaking for CDT, please feel free to reach out to them as you develop story ideas. And I hope that many of you will be able to develop something from this very important research that will be released soon. So thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.